This is Ross Feingold on the Taiwan Hashtag Program, coming to you from Taipei, Taiwan, hosted by the Storm Media Group. Today we're going to be talking about the latest country to de-recognize the Republic of China on Taiwan. Last week we discussed the Solomon Islands, which a week ago on Monday suddenly decided that they were going to be breaking relations. And this was followed up a few days later by Kiribati, a small island in Oceania. And it's continuing the battle in that region where Taiwan previously, up to a few weeks ago, had six countries that had formal diplomatic relations. Now we're down to a much smaller number. What does it mean for Taiwan and why did the Kiribati follow up Solomon Islands so quickly with this announcement? Well, let, let, let's talk about the obvious, which has been discussed in, in so much international media, which is just the strategic location and a battle between the United States, Australia, on the one hand, and China for influence over this region. But what really occurred here? You have to go back in time to when Kiribati established diplomatic relations with the Republic of China on Taiwan, or reestablished. It was in 2003 under the presidency of Chen Shui-bian, also of the Democratic Progressive Party, just like current President Tsai Ing-wen. And when did Kiribati do that? Just before the 2004 presidential election. Presidential election was in March 2004. And this decision by Kiribati to establish diplomatic relations with Taiwan was made in November of 2003. So shortly before the election, it was a big diplomatic victory for the government at the time of Chen Shui-bian. Fast forward to 2019, we're a few months before the presidential election, January 11, 2020. China getting some revenge. They cause a diplomatic embarrassment for the government of Tsai Ing-wen shortly before the election. So we shouldn't forget China's anger, not just at the fact that Kiribati has diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but actually the circumstances under which it occurred. Again, right before a presidential election, helps for the politics. At the time, Chen Shui-bian was saying, I, I, I can handle diplomatic relations, I'm tough on China. I even persuaded countries to de-recognize China and recognize Taiwan. Diplomatic victory then, diplomatic loss now. So some revenge by China. What else prompted this decision now by Kiribati? Well, probably they just didn't want to be left behind. So Solomon Islands, one of the larger countries in the region, in, in Oceania, that had relations with Taiwan, certainly large by population, 600,000 population in Solomon Islands. Kiribati's small, 110,000 population, not small by landmass either. Like many of these countries, it's a grouping of islands. Big aid on offer from China, but if you're the last one out of the group, you're probably going to get the smallest aid package. So understandably, Kiribati, their leadership probably saying, we don't want to be left behind. We don't want to get the smallest aid package. According to media reports, they actually asked Taiwan for money to buy an airplane. Yes, they wanted a passenger aircraft, a 737, according to media reports. And the Taiwan government said, well, our laws don't allow us to give you a gift of a passenger aircraft. What we could do is arrange preferential financing. We could go to a bank in Taiwan and they could give you a loan at a preferential interest rate, but you still have to borrow the money to pay for the plane. It looks like Kiribati said, no, thank you. We actually want you to give us this plane. And according to media reports, China is, is going to give a Chinese-made uh, passenger plane to Kiribati. If skeptics will say, why would you want the Chinese-made plane? You'd be a lot safer with an Airbus or a Boeing. But be that as it may, Kiribati seems to have taken that deal. They'd rather get the uh, aircraft from China than borrow money to buy one uh, commercially, um, using Taiwan money to buy something made in the United States or Europe. But broadly speaking, it's clear that financial aid was a significant part of Kiribati's decision. And again, they don't want to be the last one in the region because at that point, China is probably going to say, you should have made your decision earlier. We gave out the better aid packages. Kiribati, they want to follow along with Solomon Islands. They don't want to be left behind from the Belt and Road Initiative. Probably in the coming months and years, we're going to hear a lot of announcements about Kiribati's participation in Belt and Road or infrastructure projects that China's going to build there, Chinese tourists going there. Very similar to what occurred with Solomon Islands or with other countries that de-recognized Taiwan um, over the course of the Tsai Ing-wen administration. Uh, there'll be a lot of press coverage from the Chinese state media about things that China's doing for these countries. And most likely, subsequently after that, we'll hear that not everything worked out as well as uh, the leadership of Kiribati may have hoped, and they probably get saddled with a lot of expensive loans that they'll have trouble repaying. The infrastructure projects won't necessarily be built on the schedule 
that they were announced to be built upon. And there'll be criticism from academics, the United States, Australia saying, see, we told you so. This was a risky deal for you. Uh, but they seem to be gone. Yeah, very interesting, though, their speculation uh, in the media, maybe uh, Kiribati could be persuaded to switch back. Look, they've switched back and forth before. But at least uh, as far as the countries that have switched during the Tsai and wen administration over the last three years, every time one of them switches, somebody says, well, maybe the next president will switch back. It hasn't happened yet. El Salvador being a very good example. After they switched, there was subsequently a presidential election. The president-elect, before he was sworn in, kind of said, maybe we need to reconsider our relationship with China. People took that to mean that maybe he would even reestablish relations with the Republic of China here on Taiwan. It didn't happen. So probably shouldn't get your hopes up that Kiribati will switch back in the future, regardless of who becomes uh, their, their president. Uh, and that led uh, Mayor Ko wen of Taipei to basically say again, and he kind of said the same thing after the Solomon Islands, is, oh, who cares? We're going to save a lot of taxpayer money. We're not going to give financial aid to Kiribati anymore. It, it's a bit cynical, but he does have a point. The Taiwan taxpayer will save money in giving financial aid to Kiribati. What other reasons prompted this at this time? Well, going on in New York this week, the United Nations General Assembly, why is that relevant to Kiribati's decision? Because just last week, in the few days between the Solomon Islands announcement and Kiribati's announcement, there was a joint letter signed by several, most, not all, of the countries that have formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan, Supporting Taiwan's participation in the United Nations or, uh, at a minimum, United Nations-affiliated organizations. Kiribati signed that letter. They signed that letter in the few days between when the Solomon Islands de-recognized Taiwan and before Kiribati announced they were de-recognizing it. So in the course of a few days, Kiribati, they signed this letter. Their ambassador to the United Nations appeared at a press event with the other UN ambassadors of countries that recognize Taiwan. In New York City, they held a press event to announce their open letter. It was also attended by the, a, a representative of the Vatican, which has relations, formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan. They didn't sign the letter because the Vatican typically doesn't sign this kind of letter to the United Nations. Uh, but they, they held this press event to say that we are uh, endorsing Taiwan's participation in the UN. And then 48 hours later, Kiribati derecognizes Taiwan. So obviously it kind of negatively impacts the value of this letter. So China, very strategic timing here. One, they're trying to embarrass Tsai Ing-wen, although it doesn't necessarily hurt her poll numbers. Uh, we'll talk about that in an upcoming program. But certainly it's time to embarrass her. It's time to uh, negatively impact the perception that the Taiwan voter has of how she manages foreign affairs. Again, you know, members of the public, politicians, they kind of say, who cares? We'll save a lot of taxpayer money. However, it does hurt Taiwan at the UN as far as this letter, because anyone reading this letter at the UN would say, well, what's the point of this letter if uh, one of the countries already de-recognized Taiwan? So uh, on that one, China, very sneaky, very strategic, uh, but it probably does negatively impact the value of that letter. And anyway, uh, notwithstanding that the letter was sent to the United Nations Secretary General, we don't see any significant change. Right? There, there is no uh, invitation for Taiwan to appear at the UN General Assembly. A Taiwan official, uh, the Director General of the Taiwan Representative Office in New York, did attend President Trump's speech about religious freedom. But that, that was really a U.S. event. That, that was a U.S. hosted event. It wasn't a United Nations event, even though the government here in Taiwan called it a breakthrough because she appeared inside the UN uh, building. Uh, but again, not really a breakthrough. Uh, but uh, the, the UN, again, freezing Taiwan out. And that brings us to the International Civil Aviation Organization meeting. Upcoming in Montreal, another UN-affiliated international organization for which Taiwan uh, is not allowed to participate. It did not participate in 2016. Uh, the meeting occurred after Tsai Ing-wen was inaugurated as president. Looks like they're not going to get an invitation this year as well. In 2013, Taiwan attended as a special guest uh, of the leadership of the International Civil Aviation Organization. And that was at a time when President Ma's government had a more positive relationship with the government in China. And China said, we're OK with Taiwan attending as a special guest. But despite offers of support, or at least uh, spokespeople from various governments like Australia or the United States, 
uh, members of parliament around the world saying, we'd like to see Taiwan participate in this meeting of the International Civil Aviation Organization. Not happening. A lot, of, a lot of people in the leadership roles at this organization are actually from China. So they're not going to allow it to happen. Uh, and obviously, again, that, that, that's because of the current state of relations between Taiwan and China, where Taiwan and the government of Taiwan is not going to follow what China wants as far as describing the nature of Taiwan-China relations. So again, very strategic timing uh, with Kiribati. UN letter becomes kind of, uh, I wouldn't say meaningless, but it loses its value. It also deteriorates from uh, Taiwan's ability to participate in the International Civil Aviation Organization. One less country speaking up for Taiwan. Just coincidentally, we have this issue with the aircraft as well, with Kiribati's request that Taiwan gifted an aircraft. Uh, so China could say, look, we're, we're even giving away airplanes. We're going to take the leadership in this International Civil Aviation Organization. We're not going to let Taiwan give a plane to Kiribati. And we're not going to let Taiwan participate in this International Civil Aviation Organization. Other issues which have been much talked about in the international media are certainly very relevant to why Kiribati made this decision. The strategic location, uh, previously when Kiribati had relations with the People's Republic of China, it hosted a space tracking facility uh, of the People's Republic of China for their space program because of its location uh, in the ocean. Uh, very important to the space program. Obviously, the Chinese space program survived without it over the last 16 years, but they'll be very happy to reinstitute this facility in a more open way. There's speculation that the facility continue to operate at a, at a lower profile, but they'll certainly be reinstituting that, and, and it's going to work out well from China. And we're going to see how the Taiwan government reacts as far as maintaining or stabilizing its relationships with the remaining countries that have formal diplomatic relations. Some media speculation that there's additional countries in Oceania that might switch. Again, they don't want to be the last. Haiti's been in the news. Why? Well, Haiti's a, a very large country by size and population in the Caribbean that still has formal relations with Taiwan. And it's been very unstable lately. The president's accused of corruption. There's been protests in the street. It would be a good time for China to try and swoop in as well to Haiti. So we'll be watching that. I'm Ross Feingold, and you've been watching the Taiwan Hashtag program on Storm Media.